Well, hello, folks, and, and, and thank you for, for joining us with this uh, official Summit for Democracy uh, side event on accountability and transparency in, in Ukrainian recovery and, and reconstruction. And uh, th th thank you to our sponsors for this event, International IDEA, the, the Alliance for Securing Democracy, the German Marshall Fund, and the Transatlantic Democracy Working Group. And thank you, uh, of course, to, to our, 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 our panelists. We have a real treat for you here today, three leading figures in what's arguably the most vibrant civil society in the world, Ukraine's anti-corruption advocates, researchers, innovators, the bane of kleptocrats, oligarchs, and war criminals. We have Elena Holushka as a board member of ANTAC, the Anti-Corruption Action Center, and co-founder of the International Center for Ukrainian Victory. We have Andriy Borovic, the Executive Director of Transparency International Ukraine, and uh, Lesia um, Orishko, the, um, the, who, who's the, the, the leader of international cooperation and advocacy at RISE Coalition. RISE Coalition is building the most transparent system of tracking reconstruction funding that the world has ever seen. We will get to uh, a discussion of that, of the future, but not before reviewing the, the past and the present of Ukrainian anti-corruption with Olena and Andriy. Um, because, you know, innovating the world's best or first system of transparency or accountability would be remarkable just about anywhere other than in Ukraine over the past nine years. It's simply what they do. The world's first public beneficial ownership registry, the world's first public database of politically exposed persons by ANTAC, where Elena works, the world's most transparent uh, system of treasury transactions. You can see every single payment, so much as a penny. The world's most transparent system of public procurement, <clears throat> Prozoro, although you know, mandatory competitive bidding needs to be coming back uh, as a requirement in the second year of the war. The world's most comprehensive system of asset declarations, which, which also needs to be turned back on this year. And, and, and the world's most independent and comprehensive specialized anti-corruption agencies, which have not missed a beat during the war, um, although they continually need resources, authorities, and leadership, uh, as we'll hear um, in a bit from Andre. So I could go on, but we would all rather hear about it from our three uh, expert panelists. Um, if anyone has a, a question, you can write that into the chat box and we'll turn to a Q&A after some introductory remarks. The only last thing I'll say is that there's somebody else who knows the ins and outs of all of these Ukrainian anti-corruption institutions, and that's Vladimir Putin. In his bizarre and rambling speech three days before full-scale invasion started um, over a year ago, Putin named each of these institutions, NABU, SAPU, HACC, judicial governance bodies, betraying this granular degree of knowledge about their leadership selection processes and international support. So it's that success of Ukrainian anti-corruption and democracy that scared Putin into attacking. Turns out he should have been even more scared because it's the capabilities and the morale that flow from that progress uh, particularly um, as it compares to Russian kleptocracy that are an important reason why Ukraine is winning this war. And it's vital. Sorry, I just muted myself. Vital for all of us around the world that uh, that, that Ukraine continues um, to win and to achieve victory. So let's start there with Elena, who is the best person to, to bring together anti-corruption and Ukrainian victory, because she works on both of those issues at once and a real demonstration of the, the fierce and multifaceted nature of Ukrainian civil society. Elena. Uh, thank you very much, Josh. Thank you very much for uh, inviting me to take part in this discussion, but also thank you very much for such a comprehensive uh, presentation. Basically, I have to admit that I do not have that much to add because you have laid out a very good background uh, uh, information explaining uh, Ukrainian progress and uh, the key challenges and also the fact that um, huge uh, 
uh, achievements uh, which Ukraine managed to build after the revolution of dignity and before the beginning of the big war were one of the reasons from our perspective why Putin started the second wave of the large scale invasion. Um, when President Biden um, conveyed the first summit for democracy, it was, uh, if I'm not mistaken, uh, December 2021. Uh, he, um, uh, um, we wrote together with my colleague Daria Kalenyuk an article uh, where we argued that the real test for the global democracy would be Ukraine in case if Russia attacks. And ever since, unfortunately, uh, that was the truth, because at that moment, there was just this big buildup of the Russian military and Russian uh, equipment at the Ukraine borders, which uh, were still some chances that won't turn uh, into a full-scale invasion. But at that moment, we were arguing that protecting Ukraine and helping Ukraine to defend would uh, define the future of democracy globally. Uh, because this war, this is not just war of two neighboring countries, or uh, I've been very actively advocating for the Ukrainian victory over the last year. And I have heard absolutely different things. Like, you know, there is a fight inside a marriage between Ukraine and Russia. And maybe if, if you sit at the table, then you know something may come up of that. No, this is the civilizational war. This is an imperialistic war and Ukrainian successful reforms and democratic transformation was one of the reasons which uh, accelerated Russian attack. Why? Because for decades, um, our vulnerabilities, our weak public administration, corruption, cronism, all those things uh, were very successfully abused and misused by Russia in order to keep the influence over Ukraine. When after the revolution of dignity, Ukraine changed its course towards the European Union, starting fighting for what we called European values, but these are democratic values, you know, liberal democracy, rule of law, respect for human rights, and all those things which we are striving for, Russia realized that it cannot uh, continue uh, uh, controlling our country. And our successful fight against corruption, was it irreversible? Apparently not yet. But we indeed managed to build from scratch the system for accountability. And yes, Josh, you are absolutely right. This is terrifying that the president of the neighboring aggressive country two days before the beginning of the big war names all those institutions name by name, NABU, Specialized Anti-Corruption Prosecutor's Office, High Anti-Corruption Court. He attacked our judicial reform because we were allegedly uh, you know, uh, uh, bringing the foreign component into cleansing of the judicial governance bodies. So we gave up uh, the judicial sovereignty. Why the hell would Putin take care about, you know, Ukrainian judicial sovereignty if he was not using corrupt judiciary uh, to keep control over Ukraine before we started these comprehensive reforms. We indeed managed to build extensive transparency. And at a certain point, we were joking that Ukraine is probably the most corrupt, transparent country in Europe because all those transparency mechanisms, they were already in place and the accountability was, was still lagging behind because of those institutional building processes. A very boring but super important work. And one year into full-scale genocide, our anti-corruption institutions continue working and do this uh, pretty effective. Why? Because proper uh, attention was given for all those nitty gritty, but very important institutional basis uh, details. 
We have the civil society. We have investigative journalists who also continue uh, working even, even despite the war and before the war. Uh, they were uh, engaged in uh, in very high profile uh, cases that ended up with uh, official investigations and not only investigations with the real convictions. Uh, that is why, uh, and uh, here I won't jump into the topic of, uh, of what my colleague Andri will be speaking about, but in between 2014 and 24th of February 2022, Ukraine managed to achieve a lot in terms of fighting against corruption. Uh, this fight was not yet irreversible, but it itself has been a very big uh, threat for the Putin's kleptocratic regime. And from our perspective, helping Ukraine to defend ourselves today from this Russian uh, uh, unprovoked aggression and invasion is not just about helping, you know, a, a, a country. It is about uh, conveying the message to all of the dictators, to all of the authoritarian regimes across the globe that democracies are absolutely not worse in teaming up, uniting, and defending the global matter jointly. Well, thank you, Elena, for 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 stitching all all that together and illustrating those those connections internationally and with Ukraine between anti-corruption and 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 the war and kleptocracy and imperialism. Really appreciate that. So let's let's turn to to Andre, ha having sort of set the stage with with how we arrived here. Uh, let's hear about about how Ukraine's anti-corruption institutions have been holding up during this past year and 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 how how Ukraine is transforming right now because Andre is really the the, the lead, leading voice on that topic Andre yeah thank you Josh um i must say that actually this last year was kind of a test not only for anti corruption but as in ukraine but all ukrainian state institutions and this is what what actually makes ukraine different from many other wars that were happening in the last probably 50 years i would say and um, not only anti-corruption, but is but is actually survived. And to continue the thought from from Olena about what was achieved by Ukraine since a revolution of dignity, actually, uh, the work of of institutions of the government of Ukraine, I think, is of for the last year the result of those changes which were happening in the country. We usually, when we talk about the corruption and anti-corruption reforms, we, of course, we concentrate on uh, anti-corruption bodies. But let's be honest, Ukraine made a number of reforms where the main aim was not always the corruption, but on, in that or another way, the corruption was limited or um, uh, limited in, in that area. So I'm talking about the healthcare reform, uh, decentralization, National Bank of Ukraine reform, like our financial system feeling it, it not as bad as I thought it would be when the 24th of February last year happened. Digitalization, uh, public procurement reform, Josh, which you, which you mentioned, all these reforms were actually not really aiming on fighting the corruption, but in that or another way, they limit it and uh, give more possibilities not to allow corruption taking a you know, major role in the life of these spheres. If talking precisely for about the last year in anti-corruption bodies, um, in general, um, I'm, I'm more than happy with their results because they immediately reacted to uh, this full-scale war. Um, some of the employees, and not only employees, but also the whole institutions were aiming on fighting back Russia at the very first, since the very first day of the invasion, they were helping to other law enforcement. They didn't even try to stay aside from uh, actually even now our main aim is to win to win this war. And all, all of these institutions were doing what, what they could. Uh, for example, uh, NABU detectives and Special Anti-Corruption Prosecutor's Office prosecutors, they joined the army. Um, NABU uh, has great analytical department, about 40, 50 people who were helping our intelligence, gathering the information. But at the same time, high anti-corruption court were continue uh, conducting justice. 
even during the time when um, when the Russian forces were really close to Kiev, they continue doing what they're supposed to do, court hearings and uh, finalizing the cases. In the first three months of the war, they finalized five cases with real uh, imprisonment sentences. And this is amazing because uh, like in, being in, the, in a city where probably 30% of population stayed, but, but the judges decided, no, we cannot stop uh, delivering justice, even even in these circumstances. Uh, if talking in, in more uh, in more about other other results, um, of course, uh, undoubtable results of the past year is a, a adaptation of the state anti-corruption strategy. And just recently, a couple of weeks ago, anti-corruption program was adopted by the government. Uh, the long-awaited appointed appointment of the special anti-corruption prosecutor's office had. Uh, had an immediate impact because a number of cases which the prosecution sends to the court, uh, I, I don't know, doubled, tripled for, for that six months since he, he, he was in the office. Um, recently, uh, we have a new head of NABU, despite of different opinions about the new leadership, uh, still the competition was conducted in really uh, in the short period of time, only just for three months, and now the NABA again have a permanent head for the next seven years. In addition, uh, not so important politically, but for the point of view of the whole picture, now we have again the new head of anti corruption court. So um, even even only these results for for the last last year, I think it actually proves that uh, Ukraine is. Ukraine want to fight the corruption and the results are sustainable and this is a sustainable process and the way from which I don't think that we can some, somehow uh, somehow to change. And one of the reasons for that is, of course, uh, the EU candidacy status, because now uh, we have very concrete aim is to become the member of the EU and the EU recommendations which were provided. It's everything that actually pushes uh, the politicians and authorities to move to move on with the reform and to bring more results. And if coming back to you know like results are in best, it can be explained in numbers. Uh, for for the understanding of the audience, for the last year, NABU started more than four hundred new investigations. Anti Corruption Court finalized more than 50 cases, with about 40 of which resulted in sentences. So uh, they they continue working, and uh, I think this that that is good. And of course, the aim of EU candidacy uh, gave some push uh, to changes in, in in other spheres. And of course, all of this will be achieved, uh, despite that there is a number of things which we need to you now come back to the status which we had before this stage of war. Some of them, Josh already mentioned, it's about electronic asset declarations, which is needed, opening the registry. So bring back more of open data, which will not violate uh, the national security, because we are still in the war. This is one of the st steps which need to be done and hopefully will be done this year. Uh, we need to further increase the capacity of anti-corruption institutions. We need more, uh, more, um, like not not the freedom, but uh, more protection to the anti-corruption institutions in order to avoid any political uh, influence on them. But of course, we also need to support the other institutions because when we will talk about the reconstruction, and we are talking about it a lot, we need to remember that law enforcement agencies is actually have their work because we do not really, maybe do not really doing great in prevention. And prevention can be done by controlling agencies like the audit service, by accounting chamber, by anti-monopoly committee. Anti-monopoly committees should be definitely uh, in the loop because uh, this is extremely important tool in order to avoid uh, re oligarchization let's say, of, of the country during the big reconstruction time. And the population will support it. Uh, I just saw recently, I haven't saw it er earlier, but one of the um, sociology polls, which was funded, funded by the way, by one of the USAID programs, it was conducted in November 2022. And the result says that 64% of Ukrainians believe that corruption cannot be justified. Comparing to 2021, it was only 40%, so 50% increase only in one year, and about 84% are ready to report cases of corruption. In 2021, it was 
so uh people's uh, res uh people just not ready to uh, build up the new country uh with the corrupt practices and i think with this support of these ideas from ordinary citizens there is much more ch chances that we will achieve what we want thank you josh well thank you andre um that was that was uh, that, that was terrific uh, happy to hear how actively the anti-corruption uh, system in Ukraine is, is working uh, and has been working with all of the results that you mentioned over the past year and 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 and, and all the ways to continue to invest it, uh, invest in it, and for and further build on it um, in this next year. Um, so, having covered that, you know, the past and, and and the present, let's turn to the future because that's what Lesia and her team at, at, at Rise Coalition are building the future of transparent reconstruction systems, end-to-end -end digital information management from, from understanding what was damaged all the way through the chain to, to actually commissioning contractors to rebuild. So Lesia, tell us, tell us why, why you think this will be one of the most transparent examples of reconstruction uh, in history, history, because that's what, uh, what, what we're expecting given the caliber of the coalition that you've uh, put together. Please. Thank you, Josh. Um, thank you. I indeed uh, represent the Rise Coalition, uh, which is a coalition of more than 40 Ukrainian and international um, civic organizations that came together around principles of transparency, of accountability, of integrity, efficiency, and sustainability of Ukraine's future reconstruction. You know, uh, many people... Uh, think that Ukraine's reconstruction will be a failure that we will not manage. Um, some observers compare us with certain failed states. I will not even mention them because that feeds into a false narrative. But the narrative is there that we will not manage. But essentially, it is um, a strong conviction of um, the RISE coalition. But I think I can also talk about the civil society in Ukraine in broader terms. It is our conviction and it is our belief that Ukraine is not only and can not only be a success story, but it can and will be a role model for open contracting and for open government for the rest of the world. And I think it is exactly Ukraine's um, case that can and will establish new approaches to public infrastructure investment management for it to be open, fair, inclusive and efficient. And I tell you why. Um, you know, I think many, many of you have noticed that uh, during the past year, Ukraine has become a second word for resilience, a second uh, word for bravery. And I think we are all very happy about it in Ukraine that uh, the world is finally seeing us with our own eyes. Um, but for observers that have been following Ukraine and Ukraine's development for the past couple of years, or at least nine years, basically the post-Maidan uh, period, uh, that shouldn't be actually a huge surprise because during the past nine years, and I would like to remind everyone that um, the, the war between Russia and Ukraine is there already for nine years. It started not in February 2022, but it, it started in February 2014 with the annexation of the Ukrainian peninsula Crimea and further on with the invasion of Ukraine, of Ukraine's east. And during all this time, we're talking about nine long years where Ukraine has been losing its best countrymen and countrywomen, losing a lot of resources. Ukraine has already demonstrated resilience back then. We demonstrated a lot of effectiveness and capacity in transforming our country and many things, what my colleagues already have said, this all have, has happened during a very difficult period in our lives. And uh, from my point of view, there is a particular recipe how we managed to do all of that. And it has essentially three components um, that also makes a, makes um, make us uh, strong believers that we will manage even now with a very huge challenge of rebuilding and recovering Ukraine. Um, and the first one is our, our basically institutions, our capable institutions that are able to, to deliver uh, transformations and reforms in the country. 
and I was uh, during that period for for some time working in the in the government and in cabinet of ministers of Ukraine, and I was co-designing and uh, co-delivering the public administration reform. As Elena just rightly mentioned, a very boring process because it deals with with uh, institutions, with processes, and um, and different structures within the government. But essentially, it was about introducing the principles of good governance, principles of European governance in Ukraine, and fighting the the post Soviet um, the, the post Soviet structures and processes that have been there in Ukraine. And Ukraine has indeed very much invested into these uh, institutions. Uh, that have delivered all of those reforms that my colleagues have already spoken about, the public procurement, the electronic health care system, the digitalization, where Ukraine is now one of the, the biggest champions, not only in Europe, but in, in the world, the land reform, the parliamentary re reform, and I can go on listing just them without going into details even. So that was number one. That, that were the, the, the able institutions that Ukraine was very diligently investing in. The second one, and this essentially touches on our discussion today, and that is that the absolutely uh, terrific work of Ukrainian NGOs and our vibrant civil society organizations, and we're talking about national level, we're talking about subnational level. Now, there is one thing to have a lot of NGOs in the country. There is another, it is another thing if they are able to unite. And I think here Ukraine has been a tremendously great example and case study of civil society organizations that have definitely their own views. We sometimes quarrel, we sometimes agree to disagree, but there are critical moments in our lives, in our, in our countries where we understand we need to be together. And I think Ukraine having built so many different civil society coalitions, is one of the key successes that made that made our changes throughout the nine years possible. And RISE is now also one of such coalitions that is rather future looking and thinking about how can we make the reconstruction progress in the process in Ukraine as transparent and as successful as possible. And the third element of this recipe that I would throw into the discussion is the multiple examples of cooperation between the first and the second. So it's great to have capable institutions. It's great to have civil society and the different types of coalitions, but it only takes them to, for, for them to be together and to be united in delivering all of those reforms. And we are very strong believers in this, uh, as we call it, the golden triangle of cooperation, where you have on one side the government, on the other side the civil society, and the third player is either um, the private sector or the international community that in Ukraine has obviously has always played a very important role and has rendered uh, a helping hand in all of these transformations that we're talking about in Ukraine. And so this time around, one year ago, when the full-scale invasion, uh, Russia's invasion on Ukraine started, uh, a couple of organizations that were basically the co-founders of our coalition basically got together and, and thought, why reinventing the wheel? We have already the, the super practice of our past nine years where we had these three elements working together. Why, why not do the same for, for Ukraine's reconstru reconstruction going forward? And this is essentially what we, are, uh, as as our coalition, is doing now. I can obviously talk a lot about what uh, what we're doing. I, I can maybe just um, mention one thing, our baby, that we are particularly proud of, uh, which is the digital recovery management system that we are developing together with the government now, which is basically a top-notch, completely electronic system that will track every penny spent by taxpayers of Ukraine's taxpayers of other countries that will be helping Ukraine in in our recovery it's uh, it will provide full transparency full accountability and traceability of all the funds that go into Ukraine and then it will involve also the citizens because we are building in a very inclusive feedback mechanism for citizens to be able to participate in deciding what particular object will be uh, will be built, for example, in their uh, in their community, in their city, in their oblast, etc. Um, it it also builds on 
uh, huge monitoring tools, uh, which I can go in, in depth if, if you want in a later stage. But basically, we're looking at developing a very big ecosystem of monitors of Ukrainian civil society activists and, um, inter and, and different investigative journalists that will be tracing all of this, uh, all of the processes of Ukraine's reconstruction. I will stop here, but I'm happy, of course, to, to dwell into the RISE coalition activities further. Thank you. Well, thanks, Lesia. It's, it, it's ambitious, but I think you just laid out um... Um, in, 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 in terrific, just the right amount of detail, exactly kind of what we're looking to, to, to hear about, about why it is really indeed already starting to come to fruition. You're already pulling it together. Um, and, and appreciate that, that vision of the future. I have a ton of questions, but I know the audience does too. Um, if anyone else does uh, have a question they want to add in, please write it into the chat box. Let me start with this, this one that I love, um, which is. And and I'll just I'll just I'll just read read out these questions and and whoever uh, whoever of our three panelists want to answer go ahead and jump in. Uh, what are concrete ways you would recommend to elevate civil society in the the recovery and reconstruction process? I love that question because I think we we all agree as others do in principle. Everyone says civil society should have a strong seat at the table early in the process, shape the reconstruction, um, and 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 you know it's kind of something that people say and 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 maybe we'll have you know panelists um, panels like this um, going back to the October conference in Berlin. Elena, you were the, the I, I think the, the 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 one representative from civil society on the stage there. And if you were to pick any one, it would be you, Elena. But I don't know why it had to be one out of like 30, 40 people there. So like more representation, more events at panels would be helpful. But but I would love to to hear. Um, exactly the same answer that this person um, uh, to the question this person asked. What what would be like some concrete examples of what we could see happen over I don't know the next year that would demonstrate that that's actually happening that civil society is being elevated in the the reconstruction uh, planning process. I can actually start and then uh, I'll be happy if my colleagues also share their perspective. And um, uh, what I would say, which um, we used to have before the beginning of the big war, but then over the last year, it somehow disappeared, is a high level interaction with the foreign partners. Uh, what I mean here, uh, we are seeing a lot of um, high level visits of the top uh, international uh, partners who are coming, you know, to Kyiv, meeting President Zelensky, uh, meeting, going to Bucha and European, uh, and basically uh, very often that's it. Uh, what is missing and what we used to have as an integral part uh, of uh, an interaction uh, uh, of any high level official, foreign official before the beginning of the big war was always meeting with the civil society. And that was the meeting um, before uh, uh, all of the official meetings, which is also very important because that was about uh, providing of the uh, alternative, a little bit more critical view um, with regards to the progress of reforms um, and to give a better preparation for, for the official meetings too. Uh, and I think that uh, uh, colleagues from the civil society are doing great job uh, in terms of, of establishing those tools on monitoring, uh, helping to draft the legislation, because for us, reconstruction is not only about physical reconstruction, this is also about phys fixing the outstanding loopholes of the democracy we've been talking about and changing the legislation, finishing the reforms, which we never tried to do, like for example, the anti-monopoly reform that has to be the core for the real deoligarchization process. Uh, but we also have to keep in mind that one of the most effective tool and instrument to ensure civil society's voice being heard for the previous nine years, this has been international partners and foreign conditionalities. Because yes, there were certain um, Ukrainian public officials who were very open 
to cooperating with the civil society, but usually they are not that much. So for us, it's very important to renew those uh, dialects and, and to renew those consultations and to renew high level uh, interaction uh, of foreign partners with the civil society. And that I guess would help, you know, to strengthen our stance. Because to be honest, that was very scandalous that I was the only person uh, in Berlin. I, I, I was absolutely not, you know, worth being the only person there in the panel. Because I'm sure that uh, colleagues are doing also great job and they have a lot to contribute. And this does not only regard the civil society, this also regards the local communities, which to be honest, I'm a little bit worried, you know, to, to how to make sure that they are not um, uh, out uh, of the process and that the, uh, that the reconstruction uh, decision-making is pretty much uh, centralized. Uh, so for this, I think that the international partners should step up with the previous formats of work and make sure that they um, advocate for the voices of the civil society and local communities to be not only heard, but to be uh, listened to and to be taken into account. Josh, if you don't mind, I will just add my five cents to that. Um, we in the, in the in the Rights Coalition have this joke sometimes when we're asked questions about cooperation with the government and, and the interaction and the play between civil society and the government that we say uh, we sometimes wished uh, there was uh, less cooperation with them because the number of requests we receive from different um, ministries and different state institutions is very huge. So I, I while I agree with uh, Olena, there is definitely always some room for improvement. But I think in, in terms of the interaction between government and civil society, it always has to be a two-way street. Civil society at some points has been regarded and downplayed, downplayed only to being watchdogs. While in Ukraine, this is not the case. Throughout the last nine years, Ukrainian civil society was there in multiple uh, multiple functions in advocates, in uh, legislators, so basically those who've been writing, writing uh, pieces of legislation that has uh, that that later was adopted uh, in the parliament, uh, different uh, implementers, implementing agencies of different institutions. So civil society is really diverse, and and the functions of the civil societies was there. So once an organization is not only criticizing but also um, trying to be constructive and trying to help the government or trying to suggest concrete things uh, of improvement, I think this is where a very constructive dialogue is very much uh, possible in, U in Ukraine, uh, has been there for the last nine years and even now during the war, I think the openness is, is there. But if I could uh, just um, add uh, my recommendation, I think uh, the most important thing is that the international community thinking about how to support Ukraine's civil society thinks of organizations, NGOs and grassroots that are not in Kyiv, but in smaller towns because the backbone of Ukraine's recovery and reconstruction will not be in uh, in national ministries, will not be in Kyiv-based organizations. It will be the small, the little organizations that are caring about their own kindergarten, caring about their hospital, caring about procurement in, in their, their own little town and city. And that's why if you want to help Ukraine civil society, please do invest, please capacitate, uh, civil society um, locally. Well, thank you, thank you both. I really, really appreciate that. It's almost like the the cor corollary to the nothing about Ukraine without Ukraine, where we always used to uh, make a point of of that. You don't talk to you know other partners without also talking to Ukrainian leaders about what about what's happening. Well, the the corollary here is. You don't actually go and talk to Ukrainian leaders without also talking to Ukrainian Ukrainian civil society. I know each of the three of your organizations 
engage a lot with international with uh, international partners. But every time a you know foreign dignitaries um, delegations visit Kiev, there should there should be a, a roundtable discussion. I'm sure any three of your organizations would be would be happy to to to, to host that because. Because everyone sees that internationally, and frankly, even within Ukraine, the central government will see that and and, and see how much uh, they also need to be continually bringing civil society into the process because international partners expected it as well. So thanks for that great question and and answer. The next one uh, I have here is how should international donors attach anti-corruption policy reform conditions? to recovery and reconstruction assistance. Something that I've been wondering as well, because I, I mean, I, I myself, I, I have this experience working in the White House and coordinating these billion dollar loan guarantees for Ukraine. And we would attach conditions at every step in the process, um, you know, from, you know, certain conditions when you, to, to announce the, the, loan, the, the loan, conditions to sign it, conditions to issue it. The IMF works in similar ways, conditions before, uh, they they announce a new program. So how 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 do you all think that this should work on reconstruction? What role should that that don't donor coordination platform in Brussels uh, play? Should they have like a running list of reforms they want to see so that when the EBRD, the European Investment Bank, or World Bank, or IMF or whoever goes to, to start a new program, they can look to that and they know what they need to ask for? What what do you all think? How how should that work? Um, I I will I will comment very briefly. First of all, I believe that all the conditionality that is uh, that definitely will be applicable to Ukraine because like they will be there yeah we 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 can talk what conditionalities when whether it's appropriate now or in a year but they will be in place yeah and um another point like without many conditionalities which we had under different program for the last 9 years uh lots of reforms would probably never started yeah so it's a good reasoning for not 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 even for us for good people in the government and in the parliament to push the reform this is for them this is gives them kind of a tool uh and the third point i believe that all the conditionalities should be tied to our uh, eu accession process because this is really a big thing big thing which will be used probably um more in a more way by our by our kids, yeah, but not by us. Let's let's be honest. So this is a big thing, and all of that conditionalities in that or another way must support and be aimed on that or another chapter of EU accession process. That's that's sounds simple, but it takes lots of effort to define those conditionalities. And I also aware that every time there is very strong negotiations between the partner and Ukrainian government, what should be included, what should be not included. But but still, all of them should be going through the prism of um, a future EU accession. Yes, great. And that's why we're so grateful that, that donor coordination platform is housed in, and that's why GMF recommended that it be housed in, in the European Commission, um, because really it becomes an on-ramp to EU accession and really needs to be integrated with that over time. So. Appreciate that that description of that um, entry. So next, I have um, a question from uh, my my colleague Paul Costello. What do you think is the role of cities and mayors in strengthening accountability and transparency in rebuilding? Also, terrific question because we don't want to lose decentralization. You know, we also need to be same thing we just said about meeting with civil society. Also needs to you know pick a mayor or whoever on the you know that's needed to rebuild and meet there. But what do you all think about that? How would you uh, elevate the roles of cities and mayors in the process of reconstruction? I will start, if, if no others, let's say and Elena don't mind. Um, we are in GI Ukraine measuring the transparency and accountability of the cities, of the top 100 larger cities last five years. Uh, and I must say that uh, Ukrainian at least cities made a great progress in transparency, not a good, such a good progress in accountability. Unfortunately, this year we are not doing this ranking um, because of uh, because of the war. Uh, we will do some other stuff. Uh, we will share it with you definitely. But it's actually a very correct question with the right answer in it. This is an obligation of the mayors of the cities to provide transparency and accountability 
and not only for the purpose of money or purpose of investment, but for their people. This is what they should do. If they need some kind of help from the central government, and I, I doubt that they need help a lot from the, for, for these two, two things, because the centralization reform, I also believe, is was actually part of success story that we still can talk to you and participate in these discussions now because people were not waiting in the cities unless they will receive an order from from the center they were just doing the same about transparency and accountability they have lots of mechanisms in order to provide it one of them is big of course is, is digitalization and as i know the ukrainian government is really open in providing this and we should not only tie transparency accountability to rebuilding the country in the future. It should be in place even now. So it just should be just a part of their daily work. And uh, I think there is a decent number of cities with very good experience and uh, in, in the things because we, we know these mayors, we know those cities. But the problem is that, uh, you know, uh, sharing experience, uh, the, there can be lots of desire to share the experience, but because of competition between different mayors and different cities, they do not really always want to get that experience from, from, from the outside, at least within the country. I think situation is much different if you're talking about the foreign experience, but this is what we have now. I would add, um... I very much agree with Andre that it will be in the hands and solely in the hands of regional leaders, of uh, mayors of, of cities and towns. Um, however, the one thing and the one precondition uh, that, that the central government will need to ensure, and this is one of the things that the civil society at large is very much advocating, uh, inside Ukraine, but, out, but also when talking to international partners, that is preserving the decentralization reform, because one of the reforms that we talked about during the first half an hour, and, and one of the success stories that has been listed was essentially the decentralization reform. And I very much agree with Andri. Uh, the, the reason why we are sitting here uh, talking to you from Ukraine is partially also because there was a decentralization reform and, and certain parts in Ukraine survived and are not under Russian occupation. That is also part of, of the success of this reform. That's why the, the only thing that we are asking our international partners when we're talking about reconstruction, but also generally the democratic future of Ukraine is please help, help us to, uh, to preserve the, the fruits that the decentralization reform born during the, the last uh, nine years, because uh, this will be essentially the backbone. And one of the recommendations, again, what, um, what we can share with you is when you think again about how to help Ukraine rebuild, uh, go local. And this goes for, for, as I already said, for civil society, please support civil society organizations that are on the ground, the smaller ones, and please go local in terms of the authorities. Talk to them, capacitate them. Many of them really do not have the, the, the expertise the people, the human, the human, all of the um, absolutely gr great challenges of the reconstruction that we will be facing. So if you want to, um, to support Ukraine, please do support decentralization and please support the local authorities. I will also very briefly add here, I fully agree with what my colleague said because decentralization reform was one of the most successful and it has to continue. Uh, so uh, there should be uh, definitely the support and assistance for the local communities. Um, there has to be, there's still, there is still no understanding of how uh, the rebuilding of the most um, damaged communities will look like. Because, for example, if we talk about rebuilding of Mykolaiv or, or Kherson or Kharkiv, this is absolutely not what is the rebuilding of, for example, Lviv or ivano frankivsk which were also targets for the missile uh, strikes, but absolutely uh, incomparable. So uh, there was an attempt to approach that certain countries uh, could support uh, certain uh, regions, but this approach is not really effective because Denmark, for example, does not have 
um, the capacities or finances to rebuild Mykolaiv region, which um, has been on the front lines for uh, almost uh, the first year of the big war. So it's very important to have a well thought through approach to rebuilding those communities to make sure that those uh, which were damaged or destroyed largely have uh, enough resources and capacities for the recovery. Uh, what we are doing right now in cooperation with our colleagues from ANTS organization, we started the um, educational trips for the heads of the local communities to um, European countries. Um, we were inspired uh, to move forward with this idea when we had the trip to Italy in December. And we took the head of Tupichiv community from Chernihiv Oblast. Uh, they were under the occupation for the first um, 30 days. Uh, and uh, we invited her uh, because she had the first hand stories to explain to Italians who are very much, you know, this peace oriented nation. Uh, uh, I mean, I've never heard that much, you know, repetition of the word peace as during that week, which we spent there uh, on all of the meetings. Uh, and our intention was uh, to explain to them why uh, only victory will bring the sustainable peace and anything short of victory will be just the uh, time out which Russia will take to reinforce and hit us much harder in a much bloodier war later. Uh, but in the course of this trip, she was not only sharing her stories, but she was making many useful contacts. Um, they, uh, the, the, we even found a, a kind of a sister community uh, in the Bologna region for her. Um, and they um, promised to provide some assistance, which was later delivered on the uh, power generators. So that basically inspired us, you know, on one hand to build this person to person uh, relationship, which is our way to convey the story about uh, this war and about the vic why victory has to be uh, supported as an eventual goal of the war. But also this is the way for our local communities to get some uh, new knowledge, new skills, inspiration, understanding what foreign donors want, understanding what are the, the, the demands and what they are seeking for, and establish some contacts which uh, probably they could be able to use for their recovery and rebuilding as well. So I think that this type of building uh, contacts and uh, uh, ever since uh, those groups of local communities visited uh, Germany, France, Belgium, Netherlands, uh, and uh, we plan to continue doing that because it's also about building their capacities and helping uh, to do uh, storytelling about Ukraine, which will continue generating international solidarity and international support for us. Well, thank you all for your thoughtful answers to that, to that one. Let me uh, ask one last question, and I'm, I'm sure you'll, you'll have thoughts on that. And then um, if we have uh, time for the top of the hour, we'll go around for just any, any last uh, word remark uh, each of you want to make. But the question is, how, how do you handle the, the tricky trade-off about how to publicly talk about corruption challenges, which has always been difficult given false Russian narratives about Ukraine as a hopelessly corrupt country, as a sense of, 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 of mirroring and malign influence there. But it's especially hard, uh, obviously, during this time of war when Western support is a matter of, of life and death. And I'm, I've been thinking about this as much as ever here in DC, where we have some far right populists who are using the Ukraine is corrupt narrative to justify um, initiatives to, to stop security assistance. And it, it feels to me like we need to engage in that debate and set the record straight with some facts about Ukraine's anti-corruption journey, but it's 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 tricky. And I'm I'm curious how each of you think about that. Uh, I will I'll be very brief. The difference between hopelessly corrupt Ukraine and hopelessly corrupt Russia, for example, 
is that in hopelessly corrupt Ukraine, we know uh, about corruption, let's talk about the last year, mainly because the governmental agencies or law enforcement reacts to those corruption scandals. Uh, recent stories uh, within the cabinet of ministers, yes, well, it was not like 100% because with the MOD, it's a little bit different story, but still. Uh, and in Russia, nothing happens. It, this is an example, yeah. Uh, sometimes uh, what is more important is not a corruption, but the reaction of the state to this problem. And the reaction to the state, what we see even during the last year, because let's be honest, politici politicians have full right to say, no, we will fight on the, on the battlefield and this is our main problem. All other problems will be solved after the victory. But they try to do that, but immediately they, they receive the pushback with that. So um, state reacts, and this is much more important than, than even the sense or the nature of that or another corruption case. I'll add here that I have a very um, similar explanation. I'm basically saying that uh, institutions are working. Uh, civil society and investigative journalists are watchdogging and the authorities are uh, reacting, responding, because if they turn the blind eye trying to pretend that there is no problem, then it would be the problem itself, because it's not about the, the question is not corruption. The question is, how do you handle, how do you manage corruption? And we indeed uh, changed our attitude, obviously because uh, of the big uh, push uh, from civil society and society. Because if you take a look uh, at public opinion polls, even during the war time, uh, people continue naming fight against corruption among top three priorities, of course, after getting victory on the battlefield. So for them, the question of justice still remains a very high priority, but also because this is the demand of the international community and we very much rely on the assistance, both financial and militarily. And having this sandwich effect with society and civil society from one hand and international community from the other hand, of course, Ukrainian uh, authorities will be uh, addressing the, the question of corruption in a proper way. I will uh, just add a very uh, minor thing because it's really difficult to talk after uh, the two most renowned anti-corruption activists in Ukraine and to answer a question on anti-corruption. But I can just share with you a saying that we have in uh, in the Ukrainian civil society, which reflects uh, the overall understanding of where we're moving. And this is a this is a good link to, to your question, uh, Josh. And that is, we say, um, when we're referring to, to Russia and the war, that by uh, fighting the dragon, the main um, task for Ukraine is then not turn into a dragon. And this is why we are, as a society, as state institutions, as government, or as, as Ukraine as a whole, that's why we are talking about corruption. And that is why Russia, for example, is not. Well, thank you. I mean, terrific, terrific answers. Really appreciated that. That was 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 our sense here too. Is that the even the the recent relevant revelations a couple months ago about some corruption cases was a great demonstration of the system working. The journalists revealing it. Nabu was already investigating a number of those. Zelensky was was firing high level officials. Maybe that's the only difference I would note versus what Andre said. Is that you know if. If, if, if this were to happen in Russia, something would happen. The journalists would probably be killed or the prosecutor reassigned or so, you know, have the opposite uh, effect versus actual accountability. So appreciate that. And if any uh, of you want to have uh, one last remark before before we wrap. Um, I have one because you mentioned journalists. It's actually what makes Ukraine different from other wars again is actually the freedom of speech and work of investigative journalists, even under the martial law. Great. Well, to conclude, well, we are talking here about anti-corruption, about integrity, about democracy and about the future reconstruction of Ukraine. But I would just like to reiterate the most important and underlining principle. We first have to win Ukrainian victory 
is the prerequisite for everything else, for all of the future anti-corruption activities in Ukraine, for all of the recovery and rebuilding processes. First victory, everything else later. Well, what a great note to, to end on. I, I, I can see Elena nodding as well as I know she, she firmly agrees with, with that. Great point to end on and great point to, to remember in this week of the Summit for Democracy. You can't have democracies without a country. And so uh, it's, it, it's, it's for the whole world. Democracies around the world um, are in our vital interest for, for Ukraine uh, to win this war this year and have a democracy to build. And, uh, and, and, and we have folks like, like you, um, Lesia, Elena, Andre, to make sure that that democracy will also be transparent and accountable. accountable. I have uh, more faith in that happening in Ukraine than in anywhere um after after this horrific war is is over so so thank you all again for for joining us thanks again to international idea alliance for securing democracy transatlantic democracy working group um appreciated this 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 conversation and and all the best this week at the summit for democracy take care thank you Bye.